as, as advertised, I'm going to talk about building and managing communities. But I also want to acknowledge that communities of uh, open source projects are very different today than they were even five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So there is a conversation to be had about how did we get here and where do we want to go from here? So I've brought together two different types of talks here and I want to get your feedback on all of this uh, information and so on. So please liberally use the chat, liberally use the emoji reactions and come con have a conversation with me after this. So how did we get to this state in community life right now? And how did we, how do we want to move forward? So one of the things that I think is very important is to realize that your communities are the people that are in them. They are the communities, they, they are the communities that are built by the people that are participating in them. And this, if this isn't an argument for more diversity inside your project and more perspectives and more views inside your project, I cannot possibly see a better one. We want our open source communities, communities to be open and inclusive. And that means that the people who are active in them have to look like the people we are also trying to attract. I don't know how many of you know Ross Gardler. He uh, is a longtime Apache person and was one of their leadership and on their board for a long time. And this was just a great offhand quote that he said uh, in a meeting. And it was, it was too good to leave there. So if this is our starting point, a community is the people that, is, that are inside it and the people who are most active, and that's what sets the culture, then for those of you who are part of uh, US culture, you should be able to recognize this. There we go, now I clicked on the correct window. You should be able to recognize this gentleman. This is John F. Kennedy. And in one of his most famous speeches, he said, ask not what you can do for your country, or ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And that, in a lot of cases, is how you have to start your engagement in communities. So many of you are open source community, long time contributors, developers, uh, people who are working on the project in other roles that may be broader than just committing code. And all of these contributions, all of this that you are doing for your community is what actually creates it. Community by itself is just a word. Community is the people that are inside it. So how do we go from here and what do we want to do about it? First, and absolutely every one of you who are here in this conversation today, know this, first you have to show up. There's a really fun story here because early in my career, I knew that I needed to go to meetups and I knew I needed to get into this community thing and this networking thing because I needed to meet more people. And I'm an introvert, totally admit it. And I hated them. I hated going to meetups. I hated, um, I hated having to go and schmooze and I realized that I didn't feel as if I had a place or a part in any of these communities or in any, in any of these groups. And so I would cancel or I'd get a little bit anxious and I wouldn't want to go. And, or <laughs> occasionally, I will admit, I got to the venue. It was too much of a hassle to park. I went home. So these are the kinds of resistances that we find to showing up. So in my case, I am a chronic hand raiser. So I decided that I would run these meetups because if I had a responsibility and I had a thing I needed to do, then I would be there and I would do my thing and then I would have reasons to talk to people. So this is a super cool excuse to get people involved in your project, recognize that they're there, recognize that they may feel as if they're an outsider, they may not understand how they fit and give them a job. It's so straightforward and it makes people feel so deeply included and deeply seen. It may feel awkward or it may feel um, prumptuous to actually say, hey, uh, can I get you to go do this thing? Or 
would you review these slides or this document in our non-physical uh, world? But that outreach can be huge because for people who aren't automatically a hand raiser, if you can go out and tap them and say, hey, you have a place in this community, I need your help here, then you draw them in that much farther. Another piece of it, uh, uh, learning that I have taken away from my years in community is on top of making sure I show up and finding whatever way it is that gets me to show up. Um, you also need to develop values for that community. And these aren't the sort of touchy feely snuggly values. I really just wanted to use that image. Um, but these are values that you as a company or as a project or as a company can use to make your decisions. So they aren't, you know, we, we believe in integrity. Okay, but really who doesn't? And if you didn't believe in integrity, would you actually put that on your website? Like this just doesn't seem same to me. So let's develop values for your community or your project that you can use to make decisions. I give an example here because it's straightforward. Um, the values that the Kubernetes community devised and this is a lot through the organic growth of the community and how the community was acting that we then chose to codify as values. And these are our values. It's pretty straightforward. We actually say, if I need to make a decision, is the community, the, this, the cho you know, how is the community affected in this choice? And how is the single company of maybe this decision or the group of companies that may be involved in this decision, how are they engaged? Because in large scale projects, you're not always working just with individuals. You're often working with companies or the VPs behind the people that you're talking to. And you don't always understand their motivations or their engagement and how they want to participate in this. But you as an, in, in, an individual working in your open source community have that trust and authenticity and transparency passing through you and your credibility and responsibility are part of this conversation as well. So the, our first value when making choices, if it's a choice between doing something that provides more value for the community or more value for a single company or a small group of companies, we choose the community. We choose to make all of our work distributed instead of centralized. And that in this case means our decision-making as well. So within Kubernetes, early, early on, the decisions were all blocked and gated on what would Google answer or how can I find the right Googler to say yes to this? And that really was damaging to the community. How many of you have been stuck in a position or a uh, community where you can't quite find the can't quite find the right person to ask for permission, except that maybe you don't need permission, but it's not clear. OK, emojis again please let me know over on the other screen. Um, I bet some of you have had felt this. Kubernetes also said that improvement is better than stagnation. So we're not always gonna get it right. Not every change is going to be right, but waiting and sitting still is also not an option. And then of course, um, having come out of Google and with the super strong SRE background there, automation is better than toil where toil equals a process and a human doing something. So these are our decision-making criteria. Should we put this patch in? Let's go back. Does it look at, does it react, or does the community benefit more than the company or does the company benefit more than the community? Are we moving to make this more decentralized and distributed? Are we moving to make this a better project? And are we always trying to find places to automate and reduce toil? So those were our values that we developed. And we didn't do this in a brainstorming, thinky session. We did this as a community. The first year or so, as we worked together, we were finding these values. We were finding what was important to the community. And then we had to codify it. And sometimes we didn't get to see those things or see what made the community special until we talked to people who felt as if they weren't part of that community and saw what they aspired to, saw what they wanted from the community, asked them what was important to them, asked them how we could better support them in the community. And then making sure that that feedback 
is incorporated over and over and over. Because incorporating that feedback is one of the behaviors that you really want to reward in open source. Open source is this fantastic uh, space, world, uh, culture that is very different from a classic corporate culture or even a social culture. It's kind of somewhere between, which is very neat. And we're incredibly lucky to be able to work in that space. But that also means that you don't have many of the traditional um, motivators. So most of the people that I find in open source are either better at intrinsic motivation, motivation coming up from inside themselves, or have learned, like myself, how to put that intrinsic motivation in there by volunteering to relieve the meetup, for example. Now I have an extrinsic motivation. I need to be there to open the doors or there is no meetup. So I'll be there. But you want to reward the behaviors that you want to encourage. So if you see someone, you know, stepping up and triaging uh, issues without being asked, that's the kind of thing not to just say, wow, thanks, Susie, you did a great job coming in and working on that, but to say to, the whole of the community. This was an excellent act of leadership. She may have, you know, feedback after having gone through and done this great, you know, triage work. And maybe we can set up a group that can work on this more often going forward. There's a great Ruth Bader Ginsburg quote around this, which is fight for the things that you find important, but do it in a way that others will join you. I also talk about this as the Tom Sawyer Hook Finn um, fence painting act in open source. In open source, when you're super excited about things and you can relate and participate and engage with someone empathetically, you can actually find ways that align your interests with theirs and get a better outcome for the whole project. You can align interests, you develop things together, you have those different perspectives coming in, you're being empathetic, everybody is feeling as if they're safe in this space, and you get lots of productivity. This is the whole one plus one doesn't equal two aspect of open source. Because if I sat and developed a thing or wrote a thing all by myself and then tried to publish it on the web, Having done this in, in English, not your traditional coding language, but having done this in English a number of times, I always value the feedback that I get from my peers and the empathy with which they give it to me so that I can learn and grow. And that makes the whole procedure and the whole process of creating content or developing a product or negotiating how we're going to market something among different companies all of that requires empathy and requires that we are focused on the people that we're working with as well as the project outcomes. It's also the whole uh, point in the Kubernetes value of the community needs to be first before the company in order to make sure that the project as a whole is strong. Saying all that, you really also need to make space for creativity in your community. This can happen in a number of ways. In the most mundane way, one of the places open source falls down in comparison to proprietary projects, products, is in fact that we have worse UI and UX. So how about we start embracing creative designers and embracing people who can work with us on, on UI flow? Because not every end user is going to have the same concept and comfort with the UI that may be perfectly intuitive to the person who wrote it. So that's one aspect of making space for creativity, making sure that we bring creatives who can help us make our projects even more appealing and even more uh, intuitive and useful, decreasing mean time to dopamine the first time you're playing with the project, make space for those people in our projects, make space for the, the visual and the um, participatory for our customers or for our end users. And then of course, there's another aspect which is make space for creativity and fun within the community. 
in the second half of my talk, I'm going to actually offer a couple of examples of that and how it happened spontaneously in the Kubernetes community because we made space for it. So of course, you've worked in open source long enough, you know that offering help and participating uh, with your community, engaging with them and encouraging them as opposed to shutting them down is always the best path toward a happy, healthy community that then through example begins helping and growing other people in the project. So for every one of the people that you take under your wing as a leader in an open source project, and you coach and you mentor a little bit and you empower more than anything that you empower them in the project, those people become our next generation of contributors. Those people become our next generation of leaders. And that is the best legacy that we can leave a project, is making sure that we are not central to it. I, as an individual, never wanted to be central to the commu Kubernetes community. It was occasionally the person that said, oh, you have to connect, you, those two people have to connect or whatever, but I never wanted to be the only person that could do a thing or the only person who could make a decision. And that, through empowerment of everyone around you, is the biggest help for your project to develop succession, good leadership, a strong bench in case someone gets ill, and more resilience as a project. To that end, since we are presuming we are not forever going to be leading the project that we're working on right now, or we're not forever going to be uh, working on the project that we're leading now, there has to be a way to document decision making. Some projects run decision records. Just if, the de if a decision is made, it gets written down in a decision record and who was there at the time when the decision was made. This accountability is incredibly important. I've used the same image on a slide um, before be to talk about shadowy power structures. And that is very much why you want to be documenting decision making. It's very much why you want to understand who can make decisions and when something is just a decision for the community to discuss and, and come to consensus. Because of course, open source on the whole runs by consensus except or until you run into a BDFL. Okay, so this is another thing that should be pretty straightforward to you all. Measure what matters, use that information to go ahead and um, improve your project and uh, seek out new perspectives where you know you're not having and meeting the needs of your users by whatever measurement or key objective you've set. Within open source, of course, I like to set up my projects so that no matter who's participating in them, they're being stretched in a way that is not comfortable to them because that discomfort is learning in a lot of cases. I'm not saying make people feel uncomfortable, that's different. But I'm saying make sure that people are not only being an expert and offering uh, you know, experiences from the past and, you know, offering the wisdom of my years in this open source, but that they're also growing, that they're also learning. In Kubernetes, in a lot of cases, we were working on what fundamentally was management skills in some of the leadership uh, conversations. We were working on negotiation skills. You know, you bring a bunch of staff Swedes together, there's nothing in leading a project that I'm gonna teach them about engineering. But it turns out the community isn't made of just code. It's actually made of engineers and engineers still need to be thought of and engaged with as a whole person. So there's a huge need to make sure that your, uh, your team, your leadership and your project broadly are always, always learning. And then teaching because it is so much harder to teach something than it is to think you know you understand it. So I recommend the next time you think you really understand a topic in your code or in your community, 
find a find a partner, find a rubber duck to talk to and say, let me explain this to you. Because to try to deconstruct things in a lot of cases, in order to explain them, you will learn more and more. Funny aside there, I'm taking Pilates teacher training so that I can deepen my own Pilates practice because I'm being taught how to teach it, which means that I'm now learning even better how to do it. Another thing that we have to value and reward in that whole point about valuing and rewarding the things that we find important is doing unglamorous work. This is the make or break point for your community. Because if there is not a culture of doing the work that just needs to be done, setting up CICD, making sure there's test coverage, making sure that the meetings are set up for the next week and there's an agenda, making sure that the discussion points um, have been, you know, discussion points around the technical uh, choices you're going to make have been vetted inside your company as well as the, the negotiation, you know, in preparation for the negotiation uh, with the project. But this, this is the thing that can actually kill your project because it can erode from the center if you're not doing the maintenance work that is just gardening. It's great if you want to go out to your garden and you want to put in a whole new plant bed and you're all set up in the beginning of spring and that looks all super shiny and cool. And then you have a garden open house and then you have some neighbors come through and then you can invite more people and you're working with more people in your garden and you're actually maybe going to build a fence because you can get your whole open source community to paint it for you. But by this point, if you haven't also been maintaining that garden, you know, pulling out the weeds, making sure that the issues are groomed. Wait, now I'm mixing my metaphors, making sure that the beds of the plant beds are groomed, then you're not going to have a garden that is appealing for people to continue to come work in. So you need to find those people and you need to make sure that they are rewarded and you need to make sure that everyone is encouraged to do the hard work that is maintenance of an open source project. Not the glamorous work of a release. Not I shouldn't say that, release is a heavy lift. But not, not the glamorous work of you know, the release blog post but the, or the new feature that you committed but the heavy lifting work and the, the work that needs to be done in every project just to try to stay ahead of the jungle of weeds and decay that happens to our code as well and our project more broadly. So I talk a lot, I talked a lot about culture in this bit, how to set it, how to engage with it, how your community um, will participate in your project and how you can engage with them. And that, I think, is such a stronger and more important underpinning than necessarily having a strategy that you can elucidate. All of that said, strategy is important. Strategy in your project is going to be necessary. You need to understand what your companies who are participating want. You need to align interests. You need to leapfrog and think where this project might be in five years. You need to look to where that goes. You need to build like a cone of projection into the future and say, if we're starting from here at the apex of the cone and we're trying to go there somewhere out in you know time, how do we make that navigation? We know it won't be the perfect path. So how do we keep ourselves bounded within that strategic direction? That's super important. But I think sometimes people confuse the strategy of the project with the governance of the project. And that people spend a lot of time on building the rules around your project and making sure that those rules are um, game proof. 
which they never will be. And especially in a group of engineers who are built to problem solve. If I say you can't game this metric, what is the first thing you're all going to go do? You're gonna go try to find a way to game the metric because it's fun. Someone told me I couldn't do a thing. Someone told me it was a problem they hadn't solved. So I propose a new framing on this culture quote. Culture eats governance for breakfast. Uh, if any of you have any thoughts on this, I'm happy to hear them on Twitter. I'm happy to hear them with emoji in the in this um, video. Like I'm, I'm just actually excited about this as a fun way to describe this. But here's the thing: if you don't have trust in your organization, you won't have a good project. Your project and your community will be fraught. It may be an exceptional technical tool, but it may be massively toxic. It may be the most accommodating community that never ends up getting anything done. There has to be space for trust. And that trust is often given before you have reason to know for sure. It's one of the reasons that the graph that exists within open source is so important. If I have someone who calls me up and says, so you worked with this person on another project, how was that? And I can offer my thoughts to offer commutative trust, to offer my, my level of trust with that person to the person who is making the inquiry, who then can say with, you know, however, however high their confidence in my perception is, they can sort of put that value on what my perception is of the person and, you know, maybe get a little leg up on trusting them earlier because I trust that person. So trust is one of the huge, like largest underpinnings of open source communities. Without that trust, you're not going to be able to have a successful project. And I want to say respect as well and respect the noun here, because if we are not comfortable and accepting and even embracing the different views of people as having value just by different view and something we can learn from, then we will be limiting and narrowing our possibility to make a better, more inclusive, more um, broadly applicable project. And that may be a goal. Let's be clear. There are totally times when what you want to do is open source a tiny little library. You're willing to run it for on your own for you know the next 10 years. And that's great. But we also find that some of those tiny little libraries end up in infrastructure and end up unmaintained many, many years later. I think one of the classic examples that we talk about is uh, NTP, which there was a great article where uh, the primary contributor who has run this on his own little machine workstation uh, under his desk for like 30 years, his development, his code, his project, um, are not as well engaged with or funded, but the internet runs on NTP. How else, without clock sync, could we talk about distributed compute? I'm sure there's another technical way. I would love to hear about it. Throw it in the comments. <laughs> and actually, I think I do know what that answer is, but that's cool. So respect is in noun. We need to make sure that we have due regard for the people and for the feelings and wishes and the rights and traditions of others around us. So we can also use it to say, respect man. That, I wanna draw particular attention to that, lots of respect. So that's the noun. But as it turns out, we aren't static as humans. And so I wanna introduce one more noun that participates in this whole conversation and that's vulnerability. 
we have to make it okay in our communities to have a conversation, to disagree, and to still come to a conclusion. We have to be able to, in our communities, say, I was hurt by that. Can we look at doing it a different way? Now, hurt in this case may be any number of things. It may be, I wasn't able to access your meetings because they were at you know 3 a.m. my time every week. That's a vulnerability, and that's a that's a point that this person is saying is you know by asking is it possible to move these meetings implicitly because that person didn't in saying that ask, but by encouraging or offering that it would be easier if we could also um, have meetings at different times that person has taken a risk talking to a project leader, talking to someone in the project saying, you know, I'm not able to do this because whatever the reason is, whatever the this is, to say that takes vulnerability. And that vulnerability has to be respected. And this time, I mean the verb. Being able to engage with the hard parts of ourself, the I can't do something, or I'm scared because I don't know who to talk to, or I have to understand and engage with a new project, but I don't know anyone there. There is so much activation energy in trying to get into and participating in a community. Think about the last time that you walked into a room where you didn't know anyone and tried to have a conversation. Let's make it a big room. Let's pretend this is before the pandemic. So we'll make it a room. We'll make it at an event. We'll sit at this event. We've got a nice little mixer going on and you're supposed to go meet all the people who are working on all the different, I don't know, service meshes in the world. So this should be really interesting, right? But it's also really scary, especially if you don't know most of the people in the room. I think some of us who work in open source regularly forget how terrifying coming into a group that all knows each other, that is making inside jokes, and that is behaving as a unit, that's scary to be the person on the outside. So make sure that you can offer this verb of respect. Seek out the qualities that are new in this person. Seek out how you they can participate. Show them that active respect. Learn from them where their strengths are and then get them to help the project. Participate, engage with them, understand their needs, align if they're aligned with the project, see if you can help them. And those needs as an individual might be career growth needs. The way to get a company involved in a project, different thing. They need different things. But they still, in all of these cases, individual or company, need to be looked at with enough respect and enough distance that you can see where their value is, see the, the abilities that they have and the qualities and achievements they've made that will benefit the project and that will benefit the community, and then share those and share those in an ad, admirative way, admirative, admiring way. Share them in a, oh, you need to connect with this person because they've been looking for your, your type of skills way help them find their place in the community because of course people are messy and that includes everyone who is a leader that includes everyone who is showing up for the first time with a first you know one character typo pull request humans are messy and so we have to spend i would argue as much or more time working on making our projects work smoothly than making code. And I'll, I'll make this argument 
And it's, it's interesting because I've had this conversation a number of times inside companies as well as in open source projects. And one of the big challenges that people who have only worked within tight company organizations uh, have done, one of the challenges they have is that they are used to a whole lot of undocumented tribal knowledge, expectations, and framework around them. When they come to an open source project, a lot of that is not there. And that is uncomfortable. So it causes people to feel that discomfort. And then we get back to people being messy and needing to be respected and understood, engaged with, and empathized. So self-organization works for small groups. Um, this is pretty straightforward. You give a small group of you know six or eight or 10 people who are participating in a breakout meet, um, meeting, some autonomy and encourage them to do fun things. And next thing you know, you have hats happening in leadership, in leadership meetings. Now this happened organically and I've seen it go wrong when it doesn't happen organically. I once had a VP tell us that to his QBR, we were all supposed to wear um, crazy hats. How many people do you think wore crazy hats? Not even the VP. So enforced fun is not fun. Organic fun is fun. And you can self-organize to have organic fun. Self-organization does not work with a power differential. Like this, if this is the one thing that I have to, like drive home with you all. Self-organization doesn't work with a power differential. So you really, really need to make sure that you are working with people and you are working with them as peers and working with them in the most collaborative way possible while also trying to break down and help them navigate a world that is not necessarily kind and not necessarily as good to all the people in, in our world as it should be. So where there are power differentials, men, women, black, white, big company startup, leader in the project, or contributor to the project, make sure, make absolute sure that you do not presume what is going on in their head but that you ask and engage with them and you try to remove as much as possible that power dynamic because that power dynamic will have its own place at the table in that conversation. So other things you should know, clear ownership is empowering. Everybody loves this. If you have a whole group of people that are given an action item, is it going to get done? This point in a key regular keynote, we'd all go, no. Okay. So realize that if you feel disenfranchised or you see communi community members who are super grumpy, or if you know that there's work that could get done if the rules were different, then there's actually a lot of governance work that probably should be done. But at that point, it's not write the constitution, it's develop the minimum viable governance. It's this simple, write down what you're doing now, know that you won't get it right the first time. Absolutely know that. Oh, and parenthetically, write in your first bit of governance, the model to change the governance and update it, because otherwise like, bad things happen. And then collaborate, empathize, and iterate on your governance. Inside the project, or inside a company that's participating in a project, you can create a ton of mistrust just by being misaligned because you don't have you don't have a consistent picture that you're presenting. You've got some people who think things are going swell and some things that aren't. And you need to be able to notice that, work with it, understand it. Project cadence is a contract. So as you are getting ready for your releases, do your best to stay with your time schedules because anything that is downstream from you, that is say a corporate sponsor's next update, 
is also dependent on your release. Never forget to take the opportunity to do a retrospective, to look back on that release, to find out if in fact your processes were followed, if they were onerous, to make sure that there is an update. And if for some chance you missed a date and there were downstream uh, impacts for a company, how was that handled by the, uh, by the project, by the companies, et cetera. All of this is part of the contract you have in a community trying to provide a project. And in the case of Kubernetes, it grew beyond anything we imagined. And when I talk about downstream contracts, there are 70 some distributions of Kubernetes. And those are all, all contracts. We slip a release date by a week and a whole lot of companies have some challenges. So to just Child, or to just go out and say straight back to the old school open source ethos. We reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. So I challenge you all to go out into your communities, make sure that the culture that you have is the culture you want. If it's not, work to change it and take as many of these possible learnings, because they are possible, they may not fit in every community, take as many of these learnings as is useful to you and expand upon them. Learn more, come back and tell me I was wrong. Come back and tell me I should add three more points. Write the following talk. All of those would be great options. So let's go back to the whole, how did we get here? Talk through some of the things that have led to our projects looking the way they do, the shapes that they do. Where are we going? I didn't really touch on that yet, right? So I'm leaving that as an exercise to the reader. Where are we going? Where do you want your project communities to go? How do you want them to engage with their ecosystem? How do you want them to engage with corporate sponsors? What is the purpose of the open source project? What is the purpose that a company had in open sourcing a project. Think about all of these things and then let me know how I can help you get where you want to go. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks, Sarah. Uh, very good, interesting talk. Um, there are a couple of questions. Um, oh, fantastic. I, maybe there will be more. Um, um, but the first one is, um, and actually there are some emoji reactions coming up uh, on the screen. Um, uh, yeah, the first question is, from your experience, what's the best mm -hmm. way to make and keep a community open, um, make it easy for new people to become part of it? I guess a mm -hmm. often asked question, yeah. Mm -hmm. What's super important? What's my input on... Um, Build, basically building it, keeping it together, and uh, and then also making space for people to grow. So that is that is for me one of the pieces of this that is most important is that we need to make sure that there's space in a community for people to grow, because people don't want to show up in open source, especially if they're not being paid to contribute as their day job. They don't necessarily want to show up in open source and do their day job again. So they may want to be learning and engaging on a new topic or participating in some special interest group so they can learn about it while leading another. Um, so in terms of bringing together a community, I'm always out looking for the people who are, um, who are raising their hands to do things or, and the people who are complaining. So in a community, you can find the people who are like, oh, I'll be, do that, but you don't wanna rely on them too much because you will burn them out really fast because they're, they're the people who jump up and say, oh, I'll do that. You also want to acknowledge them and then you also want to um, draw in the people, say, who are very um, grumpy about something. Great, let's empower you to fix it. And so if you keep this actual management going on, 
learning what your contributors want for their career goals, learning what your contributors want to be learning from the project as well as what they're contributing to the project, offering them ways to get something back that is um, a benefit to them as well as all the work that they offer to the project. That to me makes for a stickier community because there's a second order effect of that. So if you're working to try to do all of that with your community, the second order effect is you're making friends and that keeps the community together. Um, yeah, <laughs> sure <laughs> that that's the case. Um, second question is, um, you talked about defining values for your community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When's the right time to agree on those because when you start a new project, there isn't the culture that then creates the value. So what comes first, yeah. what comes second? I think early on it is, I think you won't be documenting your values from like day one. We're starting a new project, how about that? Um, you won't start from there. You will be having a lot of conversations as you're setting up this project with you know, the peer group that you have, the collaborators and contributors that you're trying to do this. With. It might be four or five people, it might be two companies, it might be, you know, whatever it is. And as you are starting to make those early decisions, you can actually look at how you're making decisions there and bring up these questions. You know, the, um, for example, the community versus, com community is better than company or community comes before company in um, Kubernetes values. That came because we had, you know, all these different pull requests that we were looking at and we're like, how do we make decisions on these? You know, is, so Red Hat's a big contributor. Maybe it means that Red Hat gets priority. Well, maybe not, that doesn't seem right either. You know, so as we were discussing these things as leaders of the project about how to make these decisions early on, that led to those sort of nascent values so we started talking through what, how we were making the decisions. And that, that was the first step toward governance as well for us was just like, okay, so we've made these decisions. We've been running this project like two, and it, the time we started having these discussions, the project had been running like two years. And it was this sort of hazy, um, you know, which Googler do you ask to get permission to do this thing? And what if one of them um, disagrees, but one of them agrees, what happens then? So we ended up having to um, very slowly tease out how decisions were being made by looking at what was happening organically and then try to develop it as something that we could write down. <laughs> 